Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I forgot, you're 12 feet away, or 16 I think is the rule. So no matter how lively I get, So it's typical for a pastor to begin a sermon with an interesting story, something to get your attention and perhaps set the stage for the day's sermon. Well, deacons like to do the same thing, except I get a break today because the story that Jesus tells in today's gospel is so interesting, I couldn't possibly come close to it. It's a story we all seem to know, but I wonder if we're brave enough to take a really hard look at it and to understand all of its implications. Here's the story. A certain king had many servants who worked for him. Some invested the king's money and were held responsible for maximizing the return on the king's investments. Others were called tax farmers. They would come into the king's realm, bid on a certain district, say that they would return to the king X amount of tax money, and then they were held responsible for returning to the king all that they had bid, whether they were able to collect those taxes or not. We're not sure what happened in this parable, but we know when the king had his day of reckoning, he called his servants one by one to settle accounts until brought before him was a man perhaps unwilling given the size of his debt, who was ordered to pay 10,000 talents. How much is that? Well, a talent represents a huge sum of money. It was actually a measure of weight, and it was the largest weight used at the time. And while we don't know the precise size of a talent, We do know that when it was applied to the weight of, say, silver or gold as money, the talent was a large amount. And the parable says that the servant owed 10,000 of them. 10,000. That, too, was the largest number in use in the day. In fact, the original Greek actually uses the term numberless. So Jesus is using imagery to indicate a really huge sum of money. And most biblical commentaries simply round the debt off at, say, a billion dollars. A number that really drives home the point. I think you'll agree. The debt is more than the servant can ever repay. So the king orders him and his wife and children, for good measure, to be thrown into prison until the debt is paid which will be never, which means the servant and his family will spend the rest of their lives in jail. Seeing that all is lost, the servant falls to his knees to plead for mercy. Have patience with me, he cries, and I will pay you everything, which obviously isn't true given the size of the debt. Still, out of pity, the master releases the servant and forgives him the debt. Now note that the king goes well beyond just giving a little patience or some extra time to to pay the debt. He forgives the entire amount owed, completely, no strings attached. But when that same servant went out, the gospel says, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. Remarkable. The servant who had just been forgiven the billion-dollar debt, first assaulted and then demanded payment from a peer who owed him just over $1,600. $1,600. One six hundred thousandth of what the first servant had owed the king. And when the peer could not pay, that servant threw him into prison. Well, the other servants reported this inequity to the king, 
who summoned the debtor he had forgiven and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Then in words that God clearly means for each and every one of us, the king says, should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And Jesus then ends the parable saying that in anger, the master delivered the servant to the jailers until he could pay all his debt. And then Jesus adds, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you, not, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I don't know about you, but this strikes me as one very powerful parable. The king confronts one of his debtors who, in his entire lifetime, could never pay what he owed. And that's the point. The debt is incalculable. We cannot count that high. Yet when the debtor asks for mercy, against all expectations, the Lord forgives him freely. It's astonishing grace. That's what God is like to those of us who are broken before him. Those of us who could never repay the debt that we owe. Be patient with me and I will pay back everything is a pitiful, pitiful thing to say for us. It's totally untrue. We couldn't repay what we owe. Still we say, be patient with me. I will pay back everything. We say, I will try harder. I'll go to church. I'll do better next time. Surely that will do it. But it won't. The debt was phenomenal. Our debt is phenomenal. Totally beyond imagining. And yet the king forgives everything. The parallel between the parable and our lives is plain. It's what God does for the sin of all of his disciples. Sins that have been piling up like debts every day, every hour, adding to them. They can never be paid. And God says to us, I release you from your debt. Interestingly, this parable only appears in the book of Matthew. Yet it's one that everybody seems to know. We quickly and joyfully recognize the king as our God, who graciously and mercifully forgives all of our sins without any merit on our part. We find it easy to side with the underdog who owes a pittance, and yet when he can't pay, is thrown into prison. What's difficult for us is the realization that we are the debtor who owes the astonishingly huge amount which could never be paid. We are those who are entirely forgiving, forgiven of all we owe and who then refuse to forgive others. There could be no doubt that Jesus was speaking directly to his disciples in the parable or that he speaks directly to us this day. We live in a time where forgiveness can be in short supply. Resentments fester. We don't understand people who differ from us and hold opposing points of view. Worse, many times we don't even try to understand people who are different and don't act or think like we do in our church, in our community, in our world. Yet in this parable, Jesus invites us to consider that forgiveness is something far more than a moment. It is a way of grace that extends through an entire kingdom. We live in a country, a world for that matter, vibrant in its public conversation about sin. It speaks not only of individual sin, but of corporate sins. Not only of sins of the present, but sins of the past. It is, as, it is as if our world had suddenly discovered the height and depth and width and breadth 
of sin it can be disheartening. Sin is so pervasive, so complex, so woven into the way that we live. There is no quick fix. There is no easy answer. And that's why it's such a blessing to have Jesus speak to us today in this lesson. When the world is speaking of sin, Jesus comes to us and speaks of forgiveness. Through his parable, Jesus calls us to a deeper appreciation of the height, the depth, the breadth of forgiveness, and perhaps that is just what we need. It's odd to think that Jesus still needs to teach about forgiveness these days. With the scripture's emphasis on God's steadfast love, faithfulness, desire that no one should perish, and with our liturgical emphasis on our cleansing in the waters of baptism, uh, our absolution in the words after confession, and in the sacrament of the altar. It is strange to think that we might need to listen one more time to Jesus as he talks about forgiveness. But we do. Too often, we have let forgiveness become an individual matter. We know our sins and we confess them before God who proclaims his forgiveness through the crucified and risen Christ who takes away the sin of the world. We stand before God completely forgiven and then we forget to pass it on. Jesus offers today's parable in response to Peter's question, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Peter must have thought himself pretty magnanimous to say seven, given that the rabbinical standard of the day was three. And Peter must have been surprised when Jesus answered, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. For you math students, 490 times. And like the 10,000 talent debt of the wicked servant, Jesus doesn't mean that 70 times seven should be a real number in our lives. It's beyond our counting. Our Lord is not instructing us to tally the sins of another against us, to live in resentment and postpone our revenge until that 491st sin. On the contrary, Jesus is telling us to forgive and forgive and forgive one another countlessly, without resentment, exactly the way that we are forgiven by God. We all have things, people that we find hard to forgive. And that, to that our Lord says, remember the prayer that I taught you. Forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors, those who sin or trespass against us. Remember the final words of Jesus in today's gospel, where he reminds us that there is no place in God's kingdom for those who cannot forgive. Then remember to pray for God's mercy and patience and guidance for when we fall short and recognize that forgiveness is something more than a moment, a way of grace that extends throughout our entire lives. My brothers and sisters, forgiveness creates the relationship that we have with our God, but it also shapes our relationship with others and the life we live in God's kingdom. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and unto life everlasting. Amen. Will you please rise?